Hello, welcome to the Donahue Group. Glad that you can join us for another fun-filled half hour of discussion. We're, we're going to focus mostly on state issues uh, in this episode, and joining me in that happy exercise, former State Senator Cal Potter, Professor Tom Paneski, looking good in mm, that nice blue. Summer just, leisure. <laughs> summer blue leisure, blue. yes. <laughs> yes, there you go, very good. The king of braces, the king of suspenders, Mr. Sartorial Splendor himself. The gentleman's quarterly, or maybe we could call him the gentleman's eighth, I don't know. But here, just looking as good as can be. Me? Showing up next time in burlap. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be a summer you can. No, summer. Summer. I think I mentioned your name, He's Ken Risto. Ken day. Risto, yes. Uh, I'm Mary Lynn Donahue, a lawyer in town, and uh, leading this really kind of feisty group of uh, uh, participants uh, today, uh, talking a little bit about state issues. Um, starting with the Government Accountability Board. Now that has kind of a 1984 sort of feeling to it, but it is the elimination of the um, State Ethics Board and the State Election Board uh, and replaced with a, a, a board uh, comprised basically of retired judges. Uh, Governor Doyle today uh, suggested 12 uh, potential candidates for the uh, six positions um, and uh, a good group. Uh, Mike Brennan from Marshfield, who's a fabulous guy. Victor Mannion, who's just one of the great judges of Milwaukee County. Tom Barlin from Eau Claire, again, just uh, kind of like the Alex Hop of, of, uh, of uh, judges. Um, uh, uh, Bob Hazy from Oshkosh. Uh, Jerry Nickel from Madison. Um, Bill Ike, who was, of course, on the Court of Appeals for a number of years and who's a pretty wise guy, in my opinion. Um, and uh, so the... Um, She's very familiar with judges because that's her profession. <laughs> See, there you go, there you go. And then there's some on the list that I'm just not going to talk about. But in any event, you I would... <laughs> Usually you're on a jihad about these things. Moira Krieger ah. uh, from uh, Madison. There's a lot of males that you seem to know a lot about. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I'm going to wake up at about 3 this morning and say, this is how I could have responded to that really rude comment. But I shan't. I shan't. I'm just going to shut you down. Yes. Uh huh. Yep. Thank you. Um, She's in a new law firm. She's going to work. Using a lot of restraint, you know what I'm saying? That's right. You know, just. Too legit to the the, the, uh, the Milwaukee look. In any event, um, I think it's a good idea. Um, we talked a lot last fall about. Uh, the, the weakness of uh, our uh, elections process in so many ways, mm -hmm. and uh, this is at least, I th it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. It's one small way of trying to build accountability uh, into, uh, into those who are running for office and so forth. And uh, So the governor selects appointees and then the Senate or somebody uh, approves them? Uh, you said six out of 12, so he um, presented what, 12. What happens is the board, um, uh, Doyle forwards the names of three nominees to the state assembly and three others to the state senate. Majority vote of both parties is required to confirm the first six board members, and then in the future it's just going to be the senate who is going to confirm nominees. Okay. So they'll start out with a balance from both the mm -hmm. Republican assembly and the Okay. Although I will, I, I, I will say, looking at these names uh, as it should be, these are not political people. Well, these they never have run on a political ticket it, because we try to divest uh, partisan our, politics from our judiciary. At we least do, our, don't we? Well, we more so than we Wisconsin, try. You go to Illinois, judges run as Democrats or exactly. Republicans. Right, exactly. exactly. And that's yeah. not unusual. That, no, that it happens, isn't. It you isn't. know, really around the United States. Yeah. But uh, uh, in fact, uh, Judge Ziegler, Justice Ziegler, um, had uh, apparently decided it was not a good idea to speak before the GOP convention uh, and has withdrawn her name as a, as a speaker. So I think, I think well, that's interesting. I think interesting. it's a good, uh, it's a good thing. It's just a further step of objectivity that we interject in our legal system. Yeah. And I think putting in a panel that's now going to judge Republicans and Democrats, hopefully alike, keeping them away from the partisan label is going to be a, a, a it's good huge. start. It's huge. It's huge. That's sure. exactly yeah. right. It's, it, that's what's going to be the real test is yeah. if this is going to be the same old, same old, then folks are going to, again, just say, well, you know, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. Well, the old but this is a real independent panel that, that actually plays the role of referee or umpire. That'll be a, that'll be a, a real positive step. And, of course, that. judges are used to doing that, and, and these are good folks, so I, I think it'll be interesting. That leads us uh, uh, Justice 
to be Justice Ziegler, who will be um, sworn in on August 1st, um, has settled with the um, Ethics Board, the State Board of Ethics, uh, $5,000 fine and $12,000 in costs for the investigation relating to the issues that came up during her campaign. However, she still has a pending complaint with the Judicial Commission, and um, they are on no timetable, so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. That must be feel pretty lousy to take office and really have that hanging over your head. Interestingly enough, Justice Butler, who is going to be in town for the Law Day, the bar uh, honors mock trial students and so forth, uh, uh, dinner tomorrow night, um, has already, he's up for re-election in April of two, uh, 2000. Tell me what year we're Eight. in. So, eight, thank you very much. Even numbers. Uh, thank you. Um, he is, um, has uh, put together a campaign committee already and hired a, a campaign um, director. Kind of breaks your heart. I mean, there's. Sure, he's not happy about <clears throat> it or thrilled about having to do that. But yeah. And, uh, and his reputation is generally pretty progressive, although these folks, if you're a good judge, you, in my opinion, you find different ways of, again, the judiciary can make strange bedfellows, the people who will agree on certain issues in certain areas and not in other issues, so, uh, so it's interesting. Um, well, do, just, will the judicial board that's looking at Ziegler's case make a ruling or determination prior to her taking, I know they're under no timetable, but is there any sense of when they're going to rule prior to her taking her the bench? That's a pretty quiet little group there, okay. the Judicial Commission. All right. you, don't, you don't hear much from them. And, and they are constituted solely for dealing with complaints against judges. So I would hope what comes out of this is a strong message to judges to start uh, taking very seriously whether they or their family members have ties to someone in the case. I think uh, you know, while she didn't do anything illegal, I think it was very poor judgment to have a spouse sit on a um, a bank board and then take a case that's involved. I mean, there's there's going to be that type of inhibition, I think, in the back of somebody's mind on how you're going to rule on this. I mean, even in the legislature, we'd have people who were maybe on a bank board and we would have a bill about banking. Oh, sure. There were legislators who would say, I'm, I'm not going to vote on this issue. I mean, they sometimes stretched it, but they, they were thinking about it. What, how does this appear? How is my judgment going to be mm -hmm. infected by the fact that I play this role or I'm a member of this board? Yeah. And from my from my perspective, I think what Justice Ziegler did was probably purely accidental. Mm -hmm. I mean, just not thinking about it. Yeah. I, I can't imagine that she did that for any financial gain. Right. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure there was no financial yeah. gain. There's no evidence of that. Yeah, um, but it's just, it's, you know, these high standards that, we, that we'd like to hold. Mm -hmm. All of our elected officials, too, whether they're at the the local or school board level, and and all the way up to the um, to the Supreme Court. So, except in, except in Milwaukee, yeah, except <laughs> in Milwaukee's the exception. Hmm. Wow, well, at least getting Color maybe rid of the guy for a change. <laughs> well, just was elected under the claw. Well, yeah. The claw. Uh, isn't there a bill pending, at least a proposal? I don't know where it is in the legislature to try to uh, move judicial elections to a, a purely public finance basis. I thought there was some proposal yeah. about a month ago. I don't know where it, where it ended mm -hmm. up. And is there a legislative anyone. proposal? I, I, I know I that the study group that has been. I remember hearing that as well. I think it's sort of a one quarter of the loaf. You know, the whole loaf is to move, go to public financing of all elections as part of the whole campaign finance mm -hmm. issue. But mm -hmm. as a result of the most recent expensive and special oh. interest dominated Supreme Court uh, race, people are saying at least let's take this section and put it under the public uh, tent. I think that it's a good first step. Oh, it's a huge first step particularly with Supreme Court races, <coughs> Court of Appeal judges' races, I mean, they're almost never contested as far as I can tell, and the, you know, the, the, you know, the profile is quite low. Same with most circuit court judge races. But these Supreme Court races in the last 15 years or so have been, they've been devils. <laughs> well, they make and some, I guess, some rulings that affected uh, sure. so the business and uh, industry, and so they're well, very concerned about well, and you kind can, of rulings. And you can have cases that come up that have happened where it's not clear, where you have three out of seven justices recusing themselves because they've gotten campaign contributions mm -hmm. of 
and, and, and that's of course what they have to do, but will we get to the point where we will have a minority of judges ruling in a majority position because of this? So clearly, from my perspective, the very first place to start would, would be with Supreme Court races. And I think we can all agree we want an independent judiciary. It's a no-brainer as far as I'm concerned. But let's talk about that next month because I'm not sure where that, you know, I know Justice, former Justice uh, Janine Geske is involved in this group that has come together to talk about these issues. And so, and I think the Butler race potentially could be pretty, pretty ugly. So you, you'd never know. Um, talking about ugly, Governor Doyle has proposed, he's not ugly, um, there has been an <laughs> ugly battle. <laughs> Boy, is that like a pinata? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, okay. that was just sort of, okay. oh. I just had a dangling participle there, and I just wanted to just, uh, you know, get yes. that snatched up real quick. Yeah, um, try. There's an, uh, <laughs> an ugly battle brewing um, about uh, Governor Doyle's um, proposed uh, oil tax. 2.5% uh, on gross receipts of oil gasoline sales within the state. Um, Wisconsin Manufacturers and Commerce has gone, I'm not going to say they've gone ballistic, but certainly their response has been aggressive. They're not happy. They aren't happy. Mm -hmm. um, it's a tax. Good idea? Good idea? Well, bad idea? It's a tax idea? on business, but I don't think it's a bad business to pick on because I think the oil industry has been totally irresponsible. Um, they're making record profits, billions of dollars, and they're laughing about it. Um, I have no qualms about saying business needs to make a profit. That's what they're in business for. Sure. But when they start making billions and it's not tied to some type of uh, crisis or shortage or whatever, um, I think uh, maybe they owe the public a little bit back because they're taking money from poor people. They're taking people's money. Um, cost of doing business has gone up for every business person who has sh ships things or delivers things or whatever reliance you have on transportation, and I think the oil industry has uh, been getting a free ride here. I, I, I think they ought to clean up their own act. And I, I, don't, I don't see why Doyle should be criticized overly for this. Uh, if all the oil, oil industry has to do is say, um, we don't need billions in profit, we're going to cut back a bit here and be settled with or satisfied with just so much profit. But they've, they've stepped over the line, I think, and Doyle has simply say, well, if you're going to take us to the cleaners the way you have, I'm going to say at least you ought to return a little bit to the public good through this tax. Well, and it's a shrewd public policy. I mean, sure. Nobody is going to be sending val valentines to the you know, oil companies at this particular point when they're standing there putting $3.50 and you know, well, every gallon of gas. Yeah, interestingly, the um, WMC has been running ads, apparently, I have not seen them, about oh. Doyle's budget and really targeting this oil tax. I think there are radio ads that are run frequently. Okay. And they, I haven't heard of them. So. Uh, it's not necessarily oil. I mean, that's one issue, but the, they talk about all the taxes that he has proposed about. Right. They mention about seven or eight. And they, the first ad is when they're, I mean, it's one single radio spot, so you hear everybody cheering. Doyle says, I promise not to raise taxes. And everybody cheers. And of course, now then they say, and so after he's elected, they've got this tax, this tax, this tax, this tax. They're going to affect the poor ear, and then they play that again. I promise not to raise taxes, and everybody starts heckling and laughing and giggling, and they do it two or three times. And they say, if we knew now what we know, Except you know, the, yeah. so it's their, their testing is credu uh, credulity, I guess. Yeah. They're making um, fun of it. The construction industry, on the other hand, who will be the recipient of these of the oil tax uh, dollars, is not happy with WMC because they, of course, stand to profit very directly. Because, as I understand, the money from the oil tax will be targeted specifically to transportation to fill the R hole that was made by the uh, elimination of the index gas tax. There you go. Which the Republicans in the legislature last session said. Uh, we needed to do away with because you didn't, the legislators did not vote on the increase that was based on construction uh, cost index. It was put in the 1980s, uh, I mm -hmm. believe under Tony Earle. Mm -hmm. I was in the legislature at that time. Uh, it was put you in. You voted on it. Uh, well, <laughs> well it, was, it was put in because no one would vote for a gas tax increase. And we had roads in this state that were in disrepair 
and we also have a very, uh, well, lucrative to some extent uh, to some municipalities, road aid um, uh, program when it comes back to towns and villages and cities to help them with their cost of road maintenance. And this fund uh, was constantly uh, short of what it ought to be. And when legislators didn't vote on a gas tax increase, of course, there wasn't enough money to do all the projects that were promised to be made. And project, projects like Highway 23 and so on were constantly delayed, 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 delayed. Uh, and delayed, and more promises made than ever could be constructed. So the indexing was put in to index the tax to the cost of construction and so on, inflation and that type of factors. And it was put in and operated well for maybe oh, 20 years almost. And uh, conservatives finally had their way. And now they've, they've killed the goose. And uh, there's no, I don't think, uh, interest in the legislature to vote for uh, some type of tax right. increase on the gas on gasoline when prices are as high. So well, the right. governor is mm -hmm. saying, what's the alternative? We've got Highway 23. People are saying we should build that before 2013 or whatever the date is for completion. And this is happening all over the state. And so he's simply saying, well, I'll put in a certain percentage uh, gross receipts tax on oil companies, and that will get it out of the profit end of it rather than on the retail end. And so this is the alternative. Mm -hmm. Is this the same transportation fund that he used, uh, rated, if you will, to yes. pay for me? <laughs> uh, yes. Pay for you, yeah. Well, you know, he, 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 yes. he took, somehow he managed as governor to take money out of that fund right. to help meet the state obligation to fund When the state had the, the bud budget deficit of right. several billion, yes. Okay. Yeah. So, but, but it sounds okay. a little bit like uh, we. I, I actually voted for the wheel tax in Sheboygan uh, because road maintenance and stuff. Yeah. And then now it's been repealed, and obviously they're not going to put it back, yeah. and they're looking for revenue. So here, well, the a similar similar issue. You know, the, the <laughs> irony of all this: uh, liberals and conservatives constantly lobby for four-lane roads. And we've built Highway 29, we've built Highway 10. You go right around the state, I people are them. lobbying for <laughs> Highway 23. Yeah, 29 they're is they're great. safe, but not only do they cost money to build, your increased maintenance cost is tremendous. Yes. Not only plowing, yes. but you know, filling the potholes and doing exactly. all the other things, cutting the grass. And so you're building in an increased cost as you build more and more of these roads. Mm -hmm. And so if you continue to cut the gas tax or at least uh, take away the indexing, what are you going to do to fund this increased expenditure? And mm -hmm. the governor's trying to face it. Right, yeah. and I, 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 one, of the, one of the ways that you might look at it is there are any number of fairly large corporations in Wisconsin that pay zero income tax. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, there's a fairly neutral, well it's not neutral, but the Wisconsin, the Institute for Wisconsin Future, Wisconsin's Future I think, I was just looking at their pie chart, and, and it's fairly extraordinary. Corporate income tax used to be about, it used to be a fairly significant part of the state sources of revenue. It's now 3%, whereas property tax, income tax, use, use tax, and so forth are, you know, make up the, the, the balance of that. So there really has been a not very subtle shift in the tax burden from corporations to, to individuals. And, and this, is, this is tough because People want more services. I love being able to drive to Minneapolis or to Antigo. Well, Minneapolis, I can drive completely on a four-lane highway. I can drive to Antigo, and most of it is on a four-lane road. And it is safer. Uh, well, you know, and also with the uh, University of Wisconsin education system, it used to be two-thirds state, uh, one-third uh, individual, or, uh, and now it's reversed. It's one-third state and two-thirds of uh, tuition costs go to the individual. And of course Doyle is, is concerned now about the, the, the drop in, in um, UW salaries, uh, which has caused a fairly significant drain of very talented people from the university system who also take their grant money with them. And, and the revenues that they produce with them. And, and so, I mean, the, these are interesting issues. And uh, the gas tax makes a whole lot of sense to me. I, I would just soon have them pay. The only thing is we've got to figure out a way that it doesn't get shifted back to the consumer. And I'm not sure quite how you do that. Well, they were saying that there's some provisions in the proposal to make sure that oil companies can turn around. I don't know how in the world you enforce it. And the, second thing, the second thing was that there was some talk today that Doyle acknowledged that 
it may be a while before the tax actually gets collected because there'd be legal challenges. And no, I clearly. don't know what the what is the basis for the legal challenge. The states because of interstate commerce, that's Congress's call, and the states have no business yeah. stepping in. Yeah. And where the where the corporation is headquartered. You know, in other uh, words, uh, Mobile or Shell. Shell's a Dutch company. Mobile's sure. a British company. At what point? Then they probably have incorporation in this country in Delaware. At what point do you mm -hmm. interject the tax when they only have filling stations here? You yeah, know? yeah. Although I think uh, I think I think Ken's issue is 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 more significant, which is the regulation yes. of interstate commerce. Sure. Is, yeah. You know, because certainly there'd be jurisdiction here. But um, uh, well, I think it's interesting. Um, the um, I wanted to just talk a little bit about, we had had a program with our, our producer and our, our god, Scott Mieliff. Um, the, the, there he is. He's yeah, yeah. waving. Yeah. Can't yeah. Can't see him, folks. <laughs> you can't see him, but he's up there working hard. He's like the Wizard of Oz. Along with our wonderful camera people. Um, go look behind the curtain. <laughs> the um, video competition bill that we had talked about last time um, is still pending. Um, Scott and Kerry uh, tell us that it uh, has um, uh, passed the assembly. There's another version in the Senate. Looks like it's going to take a back seat to, um, to, the, uh, to the budget bill unless it is folded into the budget bill. Wasn't there an effort, though, on the state level, Cal, to not allow substantive issues to be brought into the budget? Mm -hmm. And that's It's is, debated every year. OK. But that's a matter of interpretation of what substantive is. Mm -hmm. And it's usually not so much substantive as it is financial. At what point right. is it sufficiently financial of a bill to be included in a budget package? Yeah. And justification <laughs> is that any time you pass anything, there is a cost somewhere. Sure. Therefore, that's why it's the only bill that probably has everything is germane in it, because something costs money someplace in the sure. whole scenario. And just to remind our viewers that if this bill does pass, and depending, of course, on what final uh, formulation, uh, it may mean the end of the excise tax that is paid to the municipality, which allows Channel 8 and other public access TV stations to stay in business. So it, uh, it um, certainly our fan club, uh, with the massive numbers of members that we have in our fan club, um, are going to want to write to their legislators and uh, let them know what they think of uh, think of at least uh, the um, elimination of the uh, uh, excise tax. So uh, interesting stuff. But it would also mean the local, if I mis unless I misunderstand, it would also mean the local communities would lose the source of revenue as they negotiate with whatever charter exactly. whatever whatever you know, internet, not internet, uh, I'm sorry, video services they, they contract with. Complaints them. also would leave the local community? Is right. that what I right. understand? Yeah. So they right. go to the state and get lost? Yeah. So this would be one more example, again, where, where very gradually the source of revenues for local local government is going to be shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. Yeah, the city right now gets, as I understand, and I know that Scott and Carrie both want to jump out <laughs> and come down here and fill us in and get the, the straight information out, but the city makes about 400000 or so, <laughs> about 400 or, or so thousand a year, um, a good chunk of which maintains the, this wonderful TV studio, but also a good chunk of which goes into, um, into the city coffers to fill potholes and, and things like that. So, but, uh, so we'll keep you posted on, on that. Um, a recent study shows that in the last election, um, business interests outspent labor unions 12 to 1 um, uh, in terms of political contributions. Um, the, um, the gap has widened uh, in the, um, uh, the, the, the disparity was worse. $30 from business interests for every $1 from unions in the 2006 race for governor. Although, please understand that business people are contributing to Doyle as, as well as to Green. Well, this is most, a lot of this is independent expenditures, which right. were not around years ago in the heyday of unions when about 40% of the workforce was unionized in mm -hmm. 1965. Uh, they had their political action committees and so on. A lot of, uh, and you didn't have this entity called these independent expenditures. Right. Today, WMC and the realtors and you name the business group do their own little TV ads and so on. And so uh, as you add up all of those independents, you find out labor unions, which now constitute about 12% of the workforce, are not a big player in the whole scheme of things. Um, and I note, and I'm trying to find my, 
uh, information. A bill did pass the uh, state senate, um, which would uh, require our independent um, committees to actually disclose if an ad is run within 60 days of an election, disclose the source of their contribution, their contributors, and so forth. Which um, um, passed the Senate, its future in the in the Assembly is is unknown. But uh, I thought that that was pretty interesting. Also, the Federal Election Commission re re bleh, ruled recently that Mark Green's transfer of his congressional money to his state committee was okay. And oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. I didn't hear that either. I yeah. didn't either. So just in my, my laborious research to make sure that I have at least well, 10 or 15 percent of what so I'm rule, saying is so correct. So the state elections yes. board? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Nice. So the $1.2 million that he did transfer in, and of course you remember there was a lawsuit, um, <clears throat> and um, uh, the lawsuit settled prior to the Supreme Court um, ruling because the, the Dane County uh, court, and I think the Court of Appeals had ruled that um, Green could not use that money. And um, so uh, typically federal law and federal um, decision makers will, will overrule state decision makers. So, so I, I, thought that was, uh, I thought that was pretty interesting. We only have a couple minutes left. Let's make a pitch for, and I'd be interested in your thoughts, Wisconsin Eye finally, after all of these years, has gotten itself together this is the sort of the C-SPAN of, of state legislatures. I know when I was on the school board and all of a sudden those school board meetings were televised, certainly changed the tone. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts on uh, Wisconsin Eye, and, uh, which I think is a great group, and what that will mean, if anything, for the legislature when its uh, proceedings are televised. I think it's a good, a good thing right now. The only uh, television that people get out of the legislature is when it's... Uh, big issue that uh, local commercial stations go down to Madison to, to cover or during the budget you will occasionally see uh, maybe after 10 o'clock at night there will be public television coverage of, of the debate but uh, this will provide ongoing um, coverage of committee meetings and other types of uh, goings on. I hope they succeed. I don't know how much interest there is. C-SPAN yeah. has surely succeeded but I don't know how much there is on a state basis to support it but I hope it does. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Yeah, no, I agree with Cal. You don't get any kind of real insight or level of discussion anymore, a five, ten second sound bite uh, on some piece of legislation, but you don't have any sense of what state government's doing. Mm -hmm. And local, local television, your 10 o'clock news or whatever, doesn't give you what you need to know anymore. It's I, all body bag journalism. Well, and we'll end on that happy note. Thanks for joining us, and uh, we'll see you again.